Anybody here ever bow down physically to <coughs> an idol? Anybody? Y'all looked at me like I did, like they did in the first service, like my head was on fire. <laughs> Have you ever bowed down to an idol? Well, I don't start going ahead of the thing. Just let me do this. I <laughs> Front row people. Make me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I never once assumed that anybody would raise their hand that they have physically bowed down before a graven image. I never, I never assumed you would because I guess that no one here had ever done that. No one had ever bowed down to a graven image before. Because for us, this sounds like a foreign concept. To bow down before some kind of an idol, it really doesn't make sense to us. Well, this morning, as we approach this chapter of Acts, Acts chapter 19, Paul is dealing with these physical idols where we might may never physically bow down before an idol. We're going to discover that there's more than just the physical graven image that is bowed down to. In fact, if you think about it, as we have progressed as a society, so often there's no physical graven image, but there's other things and other ways in which we begin to bow down to the, the mores and the beliefs of our culture. When Paul approaches Ephesus, he's confronting the idols of his day. And we're going to see how the preaching of the gospel brought complete and radical transformation. Total change. And I believe we need to consider what it means to have that drastic change in our lives. And it's the drastic change that can happen over what we will call our soul idols. Where none of us have ever bow down to a physical idol like these. Many of us bow down to a soul idol each and every day. We have this notion that what we need to do as a church is to get people to say the sinner's prayer, supposedly making them into a Christian, <coughs> but we never deal with the stuff in their lives that will actually result in a life change. It's like we just want them to say the prayer. But we don't help them. We don't encourage them. We don't spur them on to an, a complete life change. Have you ever noticed when people get saved, they, they even get baptized, and they do all the things that the church tells them to do, but there's never a life change. It's like they join a church, but they never deal with their old way of life. They never bring the idols with them, so to speak. I remember when I came to Christ, I was at a church, I went to the altar, and, and I said the prayer, and then they whisked me off to the back room, and they talked to me for about 30 minutes, and, and, and they, were they were convinced I was converted. So then that night, I, was, I came back, and I was baptized, and then I joined the church that day. And I had no idea what had happened. I had no idea that God wanted me to change the way I live. And so my life didn't change. In fact, for the next six months, it got worse. The proverbial all hell broke loose. Because I didn't bring with me my life and all the things, all the soul idols that I had with me. I didn't bring them with me. Never brought those things to be destroyed. Oftentimes... It is a result of the fact that we think we can have Jesus and somehow still bring with us all the things that we like. You know, Jesus loves me, this I know, and his grace covers all my sin. So I can bring this stuff with me because he loves me, right? We sing about, oh, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us with all the stuff I want to do. He loves me anyway. <coughs> We may not be verbally saying that, but in many ways, that's what we're really saying. Right? The very things that actually stand in the way of us living the Christian life, we want to bring them with us. 
Well, as we have discovered in this series, uh, Paul has gone from town to town, and he encounters these people now in the, in the, uh, the Gentile world that are idol worshipers. In fact, uh, the secret church that they did that Wednesday night, it was called the uh, uh, Forest of Idols. 30,000 idols in this one place. 30,000 idols. And so Paul is preaching the gospel in these arenas with these people who were totally outside of the Christian world. They were totally away from the, 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 the Jewish culture. And they were worshiping and serving all of these gods. And so we've kind of become aware of what it means to be an idol worshiper. Let me give you the definition of idolatry. Idolatry, and this is in your notes, is the worship of a physical object as a god. And now we determined at the very beginning, because nobody really raised their hands, that they've ever worshipped a physical object as a god. But let's take it a step further. Or an immoderate attachment or devotion to something other than God. Now think about that for a minute. What does that include? Anything. It could be your career. It could be your spouse. Watch out now, preacher. It could be your child. We live in a society where parents worship their children. Oh, yeah, I see it all the time. Mom and dad give and pour every ounce of their energy to make sure that little Johnny or little Susie gets everything that they want. We see it coming up in about a month where you all bankrupt yourselves to make sure that they get that special toy or that special, I, nowadays it's iPods, iPads, and irate, I don't know what you guys are doing your kids. They're, it's amazing the stuff that parents will go through to make sure their kids have everything they want. And so they pour all their lives into the kids, and, and I'm not telling you don't take care of your kids. But what happens is you give all your energy and all your love to your kid, never mind your spouse. Because when you're raising your child, what are you raising them to do one day? Get up out of your house. <laughs> you are raising that child to leave your house one day. And right now you may think, I would never want that to happen. When they're about 17, you're like, well, please leave. <laughs> when they argue with you and they say, I hate you, you go, there you go. <laughs> On your way out. <laughs> Right? But what happens is when little Johnny or little Susie leaves the house, then you look at your spouse and go, well, I don't need you anymore. And marriages are done when the children are old enough to get out of the house. And in many times, it is a result of them putting their attachment or their devotion to something other than God. These idols are the things that we think we need to bring with us or that we refuse to let go of. These are the things that will ultimately destroy us if we don't let them go. <laughs> the things that you're holding on to, the habits, the painful life, the, 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 your past, your present, your addiction, whatever it is that you're holding on to is the very thing that you've got to let go of in order for you to be able to swim. It's kind of like a guy jumping into the ocean, holding on to an anvil. I know some strong <laughs> swimmers, but I don't know a swimmer in this world that could successfully swim or keep themselves from drowning by carrying an anvil while they jump in the water. And so as you're drowning, you're like, oh, oh, if I could just get to the surface. And God's saying, let go of the anvil. The very thing that we think we have to hold on to could be the very thing that is keeping you from living. That could keep you from drowning in that ocean. Well, we have discovered in this series that God wants to do some incredible things in us. He wants to keep us in His path. He wants to show us how we can live this life with power and not constantly going back to our old way of life. How many of you remember the book that came out in 1990? It was called The Frog and the Kettle. Anybody remember that book? A couple of you. Nobody had heard of it in the first service. 
It was George Barna. And basically his pre premise is that if you place a frog in a kettle full of water, you put it on a stove. This isn't demented, so just stay with me. <laughs> that frog will just swim happily in that, in that pot. And as you turn on the burner, if you turn it on very slowly, the frog will never notice and never realize that he is slowly being cooked. Their body just adjusts to the temperature changes to the point that you finally have that burner wide open and you are cooking that frog and he never makes an attempt to get out of the pot because he doesn't realize that his environment has changed <coughs> one degree at a time. And so the author's premise is that you and I have been immersed in a culture, in a way of living, that we are so caught up in this world that even though the temperature is being turned up, even though we're being called to accept more and more as Christians, just watch TV for 10 minutes. What used to be done in the back alleys is now done right in the main street. And you know what Christians do? We're like the frog in the kettle. <laughs> we don't even realize that we are slowly being cooked ourselves. And until the church recognizes the soup that we're in, we too meet the same demise as our little frog friend. As that burner is turned up, we are beginning to be cooked one degree at a time. Well, here in our text today, Paul comes to Ephesus, this great city, this city with all kinds of power. The Greeks had all kinds of temples and idols, and Paul comes to Ephesus, and he goes right to the crux of the problem. And he asks this question of the, the followers there in Ephesus. He says, have you received the Holy Spirit when you believed? Right out of the gate. The first thing he asked them is, have you received God's Spirit? You see, the essence of Christian experience, which is often replaced by making sure our, our theology is good or that our doctrine is good. So Paul reminds us that knowing accurately the things <coughs> about Jesus is not enough. It's not enough to just think about him and know about him. There must also be the reality of the indwelling presence of the Spirit that fills us with the power of God to witness and to overcome those idols that we bring with us when we come to Jesus. Listen to what one commentary described Paul's ministry at Ephesus to be like. He says, Paul's ministry over two years had great effect. His work obviously consisted of more than gathering people into a church. We think we just got to get people in church. One of the first things you ask a person when you're talking to him about God, well, what church do you go to? Right? My, usually my next question is, what's the pastor's name? And if they start going, um, that's <coughs> a good sign. They just tell you a fib. <laughs> right? We think just get them into church. It was more than that. Paul saw that it wasn't just about getting people in church. It had a powerful outward thrust so that the entire province of Asia was impacted. An important lesson for evangelism in our day. The ultimate goal is not church growth. It bothers me when our denomination sends me that little paper. How many people did you have come this year? How many people got saved? How many people da 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 da? I'm like, really? Frustrates me. <laughs> it's more than that. Paul's ministry was about spreading scriptural holiness throughout the land. Such ministry like Paul's makes a powerful impact on the culture. There are those who attempt to cash in on it, the, on the movement, by mimicking the methods, but who lack in real, uh, the reality of the experience that empowers the methods. The old values and the old structures of culture become overthrown. And the transformed lives of disciples are a vital witness to the wider culture. In essence, that is what we're going to talk about today. That life change like we saw in Bill Robertson, who was one way, 
And when God got a hold of his life, he didn't just decide that, well, I'm going to be a Christian now, but hold on to my old ways. Miss Kay said this was a new day for him. He hadn't even considered being a good person. He hadn't even considered the ways of God that God wanted him to be a part of. But this was a life transformation. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The power, the powerful presence of Jesus in us is not just about escaping hell. Jesus didn't go through all that he did just to punch your ticket so that you don't have to go to hell when you die. Oh, it's so much more than that. Jesus came to, to, to come and transform you. He came to smash the soul idols that we all bow down to every single day. These soul idols that constantly batter us and constantly push us in other directions other than God's direction. Here in chapter 19, after John's followers were filled with the Holy Spirit, some imposters came to try to perform an exorcism, if you read the story, and things didn't work out for them. The demon-possessed man attacked these posers, beating them badly. The demon said this, I know Jesus, and I've heard of Paul, but who are you? And then the possessed man went berserk, jumped the exorcist, beat him up, tore off their clothes, naked and bloody. They, they got away as best as they could. So this totally wrecked this community. We're going to start here in verse 17. It says, The word of this strange event spread throughout Ephesus among the Jews and the Greeks. Everyone was shocked and realized that the name of Jesus was indeed powerful and praiseworthy. Look at the results. As a result, a number of people involved in various occult practices came to faith. They confessed their secret practices and rituals. Some of them had considerable uh, uh, libraries about their magic arts. They piled up their books and burned them publicly. First book burning. Uh, it says, uh, someone estimated the value of the books to be 50,000 silver coins. And so the word spread and the message of the Lord overcame resistance and spread powerfully. This was more than just a church growth seminar. There were witches and warlocks that came out of the woodwork bringing all of their idols to be burned. These were lives that were transformed. One commentary said that the worth and the value of all the stuff they brought was upwards of two to three million dollars. See, we want to just keep our stuff. You know, Jesus saved me, so I'm just going to keep my stuff. I'm just going to keep my, you know, he understands. I got issues, so I'm just going to hold on to this. They didn't do that, did they? It was evident at this moment that the power of Christ had come and totally transformed. The word of Jesus was now sovereign. It prevailed in Ephesus. The word of God had a huge impact, so much that people wanted to change. Now, I want you to think about something. When we think about Paul being this itinerant preacher who went on a mission trip, we think about him maybe going to a little village of five or six people or going to the streets and talking to people, the common folk, the indigent, the homeless. You know what? That's not what he did. It says that he went to the main town hall. He went to the places where the rich were. He went to the places where the edge. It'd be like him going to Rockefeller Center and standing up before all these wealthy people and giving the cause of Christ, debating and and talking with those who were educated and powerful. Maybe going to Harvard and walking into the school and declaring the name of Jesus. You see, he was there where all the hub of activity was. Where all of the wealthy and the knowledgeable and the, the, those who were educated. That's where Paul went. It says that he went to the Temple of Artemis. This was not a small temple. It was known as the one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This was big time. This was a huge undertaking to spread the gospel there. And he made his case for Christ, and he caused an incredible stir. So much so that people were bringing their idols, and destroying them because of Jesus. So today I want us to, to begin to think about some of the soul idols that we carry 
with us. Okay? We're going to dig deep here now, so hang on. The first soul idol I want us to think about. This idol that just attaches itself to us that I believe we need to, we need to d- demolish today. The first one is what we will call the deception infection. The deception infection. In other words, self-deception. <laughs> How many of you watch American Idol? Come on, guys. Now, let's see if you guys are being honest. I, I, I used to watch the whole show, but I got... You can ask my wife. I hate it when it gets to where America votes because I've seen some great singers that just get voted off. I'm like, what? That's actually talent right there. Yeah, true. <coughs> but the first few episodes when they're going town to town, and I'm wondering, does that person have any idea how horrible they sound? I mean, they get up there and they go, I am the next American Idol. And then they start singing and you're like, turn it down. It's like scratching a chalkboard. It's so bad. And then they walk out and they're all mad because they said, get out of here. You're not a singer. And they say, I'm going to be the next Idol. You just missed out. Blah, 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 blah. They're cussing and, you know, all that they do. And I know part of that is entertainment, but so many people are self-deceived. They're they're not able to tell themselves the truth about who they are. Now, my granddaughter, she loves to sing. Madison loves, we just had this conversation yesterday, uh, Friday. And she's singing, and she said, Papa, I know I can't sing. And I'm like, yes, you can. She's like, oh, Papa, you know I can't sing. (laughs) She understands. She tries. When we're, you know, alone, she'll sing with Kayla at the top of her lungs. She's all off key. <laughs> but she doesn't care. But she also realizes that it will never be her opportunity to stand in front of the church and sing like that. <laughs> she knows that. <clears throat> but how often are we self-deceived and we think we don't want to tell the truth about ourselves. We don't want to be honest about who we are. Self-deception is powerful. We see ourselves through a lens of our experience or our beliefs or our perspectives or even our pain. And what happens is our view is so distorted. It's kind of like if if I were to get my glasses cracked and it would take a couple weeks in order for me to... I've got an old pair of glasses that are just scratched up. And when you put them on, it's like... But how about if we look through that lens all the time? See, when you view the li- your life through your pain or through your perspective, you're seeing it in a distorted <laughs> way. And that's what happens. We refuse to see the truth. We don't understand our blind spots. Our hearts at the best day are utterly wicked. Jeremiah said it. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things. You cannot trust your heart. You cannot trust your feelings, your emotions. No matter how objective you may think you are, your viewpoint or the way you see yourself is always distorted. Every woman sees herself as overweight. And every guy sees himself as Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> 20 years ago. You know what I'm saying? Go up by the thing and you're like, look at me. <coughs> Come on, guys, you know what I'm talking about. And every woman sees herself in a distorted way. We do it all the time. So here's our challenge. The longer that we view ourselves through a distorted lens, the more likely we are to be uh, to believe a distorted truth. Right? The more likely we are to see things from the wrong perspective. Base our decisions or our actions on a false belief system. So my question to you is, what is the remedy? What is the remedy? Well, here it is. You've got to destroy this idol by telling yourself the truth. Have you ever asked someone to tell you the truth about you? Someone that you that has that ability to let you speak into their life like that? It's a scary thing. Ask somebody, what do you really think about the way I look? You know why I say, honey, does this dress make me look fat? They don't want you to answer. That's a rhetorical question. Put food in your mouth at that moment. <laughs> but have we ever decided we want to really know who we are, we've got to tell ourselves the truth and stop living in denial. Proverbs 15 says this, Whoever eats life 
giving correction. In other words, whoever hears the truth from God will be at home among wise, the wise. Those who disregard discipline despise themselves. But the one who heeds correction, the one who is willing to take it in, will gain understanding. So often we hear God's truth and we have two ways to respond. We can either hear it and accept it, or refuse to hear it and deny that it's real. Right? Right? James says it like this. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Even when it hurts. Even when it hurts. Because oftentimes the truth does hurt. The gospel is offensive. It challenges us. It motivates us. He says, otherwise you're only fooling yourself. For if you listen to the word of God, don't obey. It's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away and forget what you look like. Some of you spend a whole lot of time in the front of the mirror. I used to think that women did, but I'm finding out most women say, oh no, the reason we're late is because of him. <laughs> He's always in primping in front of that mirror. So I've had a new, see, I don't have the issue. I just get out and dry off and I'm gone. So shave your heads, guys. There's magic there. <laughs> but it would be silly for us to get in front of the mirror and, see, and then walk away and forget or refuse to remember. The Word of God is like a mirror. We see ourselves for who we really are. Listen to the truth. Let the truth of God be the thing that corrects the way you see yourself. By listening to God's Word and accepting it and doing what it says, we begin to destroy the, accept, the deception infection. Remember, Jesus said these powerful words. He didn't say that love will set you free. Remember that song? All you need is love. Da, 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 da. Oh man, if we just had love, the world would be a better place. If we just had grace, I would be happy. What did Jesus say in John 8, 8 32? The truth is what sets us free. That's how you destroy the deception infection. Truth. Second idol we need to demolish is toxic thinking. Toxic thinking. Henry David Perot said this, Thought is the sculptor who can create the person you want to be. Think about that for a minute. Thought is the sculpture who creates the person you want to be. Another famous person said these words, Cogito ergo sum. Anybody remember that? I think they're for him. Cogito ergo sum. Anybody want to take a stab at it? Latin. I think, therefore I am. I think, therefore I am. So if I think not, then I disappear? No, anyway. That's a little joke. Yeah. I think, therefore I am. There's some truth to that. There's some truth. So many of us believe things about ourselves that aren't true. And until we understand what God has to say, until we understand what the Word of God has to say, we'll always be a victim of toxic thinking. I have a great counselor friend of mine. He's a licensed marriage and family therapist, and every now and then I go see him because y'all make me crazy. And this is what he said one day. He said, what you think about something will determine how you feel about it. And the way you feel about it will determine your actions. Man, that is so true. The way we think will determine how we feel, and the way we feel will determine the way we live. And that even includes the way you think about yourself. So many of us are victims of the things that our parents said to us, or that a coach said to you, or that a pastor said to you, or that a parent said to you, or that a teacher said to you. And the words inflicted particularly by your fathers, particularly by your fathers, have an inordinate amount of power in your life. We know ultimately where toxic thinking comes from, right? We do know that this is Satan's most effective weapon to use. If he can get you deceived, if he can get you to think less of yourself than you ought to, because it's our thought life, particularly about the way we think about ourselves. 
that can do the most damage on the inside. Proverbs said this, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So the way you think about yourselves, in many ways, determines the path you choose. So what you and I think about ourselves determines our self-awareness. So, what is the remedy? I'm glad you asked. Here it is. The remedy is that we must be determined to overcome these false beliefs. We've got to be determined to overcome these false beliefs. The bottom line is the only way I can discover who I am is to discover who I am in Christ. Discover who I am in Christ. Listen to what Paul said in Galatians 2.20. He says, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. So the way that you and I can overcome false beliefs is to recognize what Christ has done for us and to constantly remind ourselves of that truth. Destroying this soul idol requires us understanding that Christ gave His all for us. And you and I need to remember that we mean that much to Him. Again, in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, he gives us a remedy for toxic thought life. He says, The weapons of the war we're fighting are not of this world, but are powered by who? Powered by God and effective at tearing down the strongholds erected against Him. We are demolishing arguments and ideas and every high and mighty philosophy that pits itself against the knowledge of the one true God. Of the one true God. We are taking prisoners every thought, every emotion, and subduing them into obedience of Jesus. That's how you destroy this toxic thought life. It's like a virus firewall protects your computer. You and I must remain vigilant over our thought life and against Satan's lies that threaten to corrupt corrupt the hard drive of your mind. As Christians, we have weapons. Those weapons are faith, those weapons are prayer, and those weapons are God's word. If we're going to win the battle of the mind, then God's truth is the thing that will release us from this prison of soul items. The next soul item we need to smash is lethal language. Lethal language. Mother Teresa once said, words which do not give light of Christ, the light of Christ, increase the darkness. Words which do not give the light of Christ increase the darkness. Let me throw out another phrase, see if you're familiar with this one. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never harm me. How many of you have heard of that? Every person on the planet has heard of this. And how many of us know how utterly wrong it is? It is a lie. It is a fat lie. Yes, sticks and stones will break your bones. But many times those bones heal. But words... Words sometimes are never healed. Words sometimes we never get over. I still carry the scars with me for words that were spoken to me when I was a kid by my father. My dad and I, we reconciled, we hugged, and we, he apologized, and we, we had a great time. His last six years, I led him to Christ. I was able to be there that day at 76. My dad gave his life to Jesus. And so for six years, he followed Jesus and just a new man. But to this day, some of the things that he spoke over me as a child, I still battle. And I'm going to guess that I'm not the only one in this room. Moms and dads, you have the power. You know that passage, the power of life and death in the tongue? Moms and dads have that power. Especially dads. Especially dads. I don't know what it is. Maybe because the mom's more nurturing and 
Dad's a little rough, I don't know, but there's something about the words of a father that can bring healing, that can build up, and then there's those words that can tear down. We have the power in our tongues. Words we say to one another can be devastating if they're not shared with love. Proverbs 18. Good, good passage here. Wise words satisfy like a good meal. The right words bring satisfaction. The tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. And then James echoes the same philosophy. He says it only takes a spark, remember, to set off a forest fire. A careless word or a wrongly placed word out of your mouth can do that. By your speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony into chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke and go up in smoke with it. Smoke that is right from the pit of hell. So, what is the remedy? Glad you asked. The remedy to this is for us to use life-giving language. Use life-giving language. If you have children that are young and they're still in your home and they're still impressionable, use life-giving language. What's the first word most kids learn? My grandson's a professional knower. <laughs> Beckett says no to everything. So I, I we got in the car one day and he, was, he didn't want me to buckle him in. And I said, yes. Yes. And he was like, no. I said, yes. And he went, yes. <laughs> just like that. So everything, I said, yes. And he went, yes. He may not have meant it, but just that one moment, I was able to change a little of the dialogue there. And if you have opportunities to begin to speak life-giving language, speak it. Resist the urge to say, you idiot. You dummy. You're so fat. You're stupid. Now, none of us would say any of this to any of our friends out here. But how many of us speak like that in our homes? Man, use life-giving <coughs> language. Listen to what Proverbs says. The mouth of a good person is a deep, life-giving well. But the mouth of the wicked is a dark cave of abuse. Kind words heal and help. Cutting words wound and Name. Now, we obviously can't control what others say to us, but we can control what we say to others, can't we? We can also control what we believe about ourselves. Since toxic words can destroy the soul, we must passionately guard our hearts against them. Proverbs 4.23 tells us to guard our hearts above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Solomon warns us to be vigilant. Refuse to let down your guard on your heart. One translation says, because it is the wellspring of life. Your heart is what determines the course of where you live. So we must keep others from dumping their toxic waste into our water supply. The last soul idol we've got to destroy. Number four is the hazardous waste. The hazardous waste waste. When we sin, we have a tendency to deny it, don't we? Come on, don't get churchy on me. When we <coughs> sin, we have a tendency to want to hide it, to cover it up, to bury it. We must rid ourselves of the hazardous waste that is destroying us. Show that next picture there, Savannah. Uh, Savannah. <laughs> These are my grandsons. Beckett and Hunter, they love each other. They really do. But like cousins, they also love to hate each other. Well, we went over to Nick's house to watch the Dolphins beat the Chargers. That was a good day. Not unlike the, la the last game we had, which all of you Panther fans had your fun, your moment in the sun. All I'm saying is if you make it to the Super Bowl, please don't choke this year. Win this one, please. Win this one. Sorry, I had to do that. So we're over... Nick's house, and it's just the three guys, the three guys hanging out. Lindsay's back in the bedroom saying, I don't want to be a part of this. She's hiding out. So we got these two just running free throughout the house. Well, they would go into Hunter's playroom, and then you would hear a, ah! you know, somebody was dying. So dads would go rush in, and usually it was Beckett that was crying. 
And the first time he came in the living room, he's like, ah, 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 and then he watched TV for a second. And then he goes, ah, oh, I'm crying. Ah. So then he goes in there and they're playing again, and then we hear a real cry. We hear a thud and then a ah, you know how it sounds. So they go running in and they come out, and Beckett's just really hurting. And so Nick goes over and he says, Hunter, did you hit Beckett? No, Dad. <laughs> I didn't hit Beck. Are you sure? Why is he crying like that? Did you hit it? No, Dad. I didn't hit Beck. All right. So we go on, and I think the pizza man got there, and they're getting the pizza out, and I had a little magna doodle sitting next to me. And so all it had on it was a face with two eyes and a nose. Well, Hunter walks up, and he draws a frown on the face. And I look down, and I said, what's that? He's not happy. I said, so why is he not happy? Because he's yying. <laughs> I said, really? What's he lying about? He hit Beckett. <laughs> and I said, you hit Beckett? And he goes, how did you know? <laughs> Dude, that's scary. See, his first inclination is to cover it up and to bury it. And that's what happens when we do that with our sin. We create this hazardous waste. And before you and I judge Hunter, how many of us have ever been caught in a lie? And those of you who didn't raise your hands, I just caught you in one. Right? Oh, man, how did you know? Same thing, Hunter. Same thing. I'm guessing that this won't be Hunter's last incident with lying because I know his father... <laughs> and I know the rest of us and I know this won't be his last issue but what I also know is that because of his sinful, sinful nature because of our sinful nature this is where we always default we always go to this idea of choosing our own way over God's way and usually our sinful nature begins to snowball into an avalanche of deception. Just like when Adam and Eve sinned against God. They could have just run into the garden and said, We did it! We bit the apple, God, please forgive us! But what did they do? They hid. They did everything they could to hide. They even hid themselves. They covered their bodies and they tried to hide from an all-seeing God. Because that is the default of our nature. So the remedy, you might be asking, <laughs> of this sin is we must unearth the hidden sin. We must come clean with what's going on in our life. Towns where companies in the, in the past have hidden hazardous material, they took the hazardous waste and they dug deep holes and they buried it and they covered it up nice and pretty, even put plants on it. Some of them built houses. What happened at first? <coughs> Nothing. Nobody knew. Because that hazardous waste was buried beneath, and you couldn't tell. But what happened the years after that? That hazardous waste began to seep up into the soil, and then it got into the water systems. And so they all of a sudden had this incredible high uh, uh, death at birth. Babies born, stillborn. Then they started having an enormous amount of uh, cancer issues in those towns. And then the fish no longer could reproduce, so all of the, the fisheries were dying. All of the animals were being born deformed and people being born deformed, all because they refused to unearth the hazardous waste. Instead of getting rid of it the way they should have, they, did they attempted to bury it. Well, this is what happens when you sin and you just cut it up. Just sweep it under the carpet. It'll be okay. That's what happens when we begin to bury the sin in our lives. When you bury sin, it's the same way as burying hazardous waste. Because it will come back, I promise. And listen to God's answer. Listen to this remedy in 1 John 1.9. 1 of my favorite passages. It says this, But if we own up to our sins... That is huge. When you own up to your sin, God shows us that He is faithful and just 
by forgiving us our sin and purifying us from the pollution of all the bad things we've done. <coughs> if you confess your sin, God is faithful. He is just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all the pollution that you tried to bury in your life. No matter how clever you may think you are, you can never successfully hide your sins from God. That's what Numbers reminds us. This, this passage kind of scares me a little bit. Be sure that your sin will find you out. So if you don't unearth your hazardous waste, God will unearth it for you. And it's the difference between humility and humiliation. If you act in humility and unearth your, your hazardous waste, he, God's right there. He says, yeah, we, we got this. But if God has to do it, then it ends up in humility. Just ask the psalmist. Right? He refused to unearth the hazardous waste in his life. And it came up later, didn't it? It came up in a horrible way. Proverbs 28.13 says that people who conceal their sins will not prosper. But if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. I, I want to just get real straight with you right now. If you've got things in your life, hazardous waste, that you've been trying to bury, and nobody saw you go out in the darkness of night and dig that hole and bury it, I want you to know, God is holding the shame. He knows exactly what it is. He knows exactly that sin you're trying to hide that nobody ever would know. And today, He's calling you to completely come before Him and smash that soul idol. You've been wondering what this is? So was I. I'm just, somebody set this here. I don't know what it is. When Paul walked into Ephesus that day and he preached the Word of God, are you, it'll, it'll be alright. Alright, hold it for me. Yeah, I might as well hold it. He walked into Ephesus and he began to preach the Word of God. And the transformation that happened was amazing. These people brought their idols and they smashed it. They totally smashed all of the idols in their life. And you know what they didn't do? Thank you, Robert. They didn't pick up the pieces and say, I'm just going to keep this as a momentum. Right? That's how we do it. We go before God and we're like, oh God, forgive me, I'm so sorry. But here, let me just grab that in case I need it again. <laughs> I'm just going to take that over here because you know I need it. I got the shakes, I need it. Right? No. It says that they brought their idols and they smashed them, totally burning everything in their lives that kept them from being the men and the woman of God that God had called them to be. And today I want to call you to that place that you would be that honest with God. That whatever it is you thought you've, hide, you've hidden from Him, you're, you're sitting in your seat going, oh, no. He knows. Yeah, He knows. He knows. Listen to what Jeremiah 23, 29 says. Does not my word burn like fire? The Lord says, does it not shatter rock like a strong hammer? You see, the psalmist, David, King David, was, was known as a man after God's own heart. And he committed a terrible sin. And you know the story. He did everything he could to bury the hazardous waste. Killing the husband of the wife that he slept with. Just, I, can, I, I got this. We can make it nice. Then the prophet came and he said, you're that guy. You're the one who stole your neighbor's wife. And David fell apart. So what could have been an act of humility by not going down that road. Instead, he tried to cover it up and now it became public humiliation and he lost his son. 
So as we close today, I want to read you David's prayer. And I want to invite you to say this same prayer over your own life. Because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Do not keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Rejoice to me, re restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Bow with me, if you would. Bill, if you just bring the house lights.